Right, so I'm going to get started with the second part of testing, that is testing complex uh, software. The first testing module that you saw earlier was about introduction to testing, types of tests, and how to design them. And this presentation is mostly going to focus on how do you de design tests for uh, complex software. This is a license slide. The, the first question is, how do you build your test suite and what forms a good collection of tests that will exercise your software uh, in the way you want it to be exercised? So there are two levels of tests that we recognize. One is continuous integration, and that has gained popularity in the last few years. And that, and that basically ensures that tests run as soon as you commit a code, com commit a piece of code to your repo, or if you have a pull request accepted to the Git repo, that's when the continuous integration test will run and verify that nothing has failed. And these CI, continuous integration tests, are designed for quick diagnosis of errors. Now, in a complex software, you cannot have a comprehensive coverage through continuous integration because it will take too long. And you, know, you don't have that many hours uh, uh, to spare after every commit. So in that case, a second level of testing, which is called as nightly tests or scheduled testing becomes important. Here, because you can, you can afford to spend more hours, you can afford to have more coverage. So when you are thinking about uh, granularity of tests, when you're thinking about devising your tests, you have to mix, you have to think about how do you want to mix the granularity. And the rule of thumb is that we want the test to be simple, but we also want to ensure that they enable us to quickly pinpoint the source of errors. Now it's important to, uh, to uh, devise tests for isolated components. And I'm choosing to call tests for isolated components as unit tests out here. A unit test in software engineering means something else, so we are deviating from standard terminology. So the unit testing out here may not be a single routine. It may be a collection of functions, but it's basically an isolated component of your code. And if such a unit test fails, then you know that the fault lies in your isolated component. Uh, the next step, uh, you know, is once from unit testing is to interoperate these various components, which means that you will need tests at, tests at integration level, system level, and they, are, they can be pretty complex. In the scientific world, you also have a specific class of tests that, that you don't, know, don't always hear about in software engineering, and that's called as restart tests. So the reason why you have this is that when you're running your code on large machines, your code uh, will take a long time to run, and you submit your job, to a batch queuing system and you're given a time slot. So your job might not complete in one time slot. And so you may need to resubmit again and again, and it may take multiple uh, time slots. And every time you resubmit, you want your code to start, restart from at a point where it previously stopped. So that, uh, you know, you basically want the, this restart to be as transparent as possible so that the final result has no idea that the job completed in several batches. And so it's very important in scientific computing to have these kind of restart tests built into your test suite for uh, comprehensive coverage. So a lot of resources, you can find a lot of resources on the link that's given here that's pointing to the ideas productivity website. Uh, and there are a lot of resources on testing out there. So why not always use the most stringent testing? And the answer is basically li lies on how are the resources available for testing for you? So no team has uh, infinite resources and creating tests and designing tests, uh, basically this is a tax on the team. So you have, to, uh, you have to figure out what is the right balance. When the tax is too high, then you're spending too much time testing and you don't have too much time for code development. But when the tax is too low, then you are spending too much time developing the code and not testing the code. So it's possible that defects might uh, sneak up in the code. So you have to evaluate what your uh, project needs are and what your objectives are when it comes to testing. For example, if you just have a one-off test, then you don't want that one-off test to be very complex. You just want to make sure that it verifies the job that it's supposed to do, and then you move on. So testing decisions are, are, have to depend on you know, the life cycle stage of the code, the code size, the, the team size and the degree of heterogeneity, the lifetime of the code, the complexity of the code and so on. You know, life cycle out here basically means that, let's say a code is new. And for example, if you have a numerical method code, then you have to ensure that your testing is not only testing for correctness, but it's also testing for stability and testing for accuracy. 
or if you have a production code, then you want to make sure that you're admitting into areas that have not been exercised before, because you don't know what user will hit what area during production. And if it is refactoring code, then you want to make sure that you're testing any part of the code that has been touched when you're trying to refactor portions of it. So you need to evaluate your uh, project needs. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is uh, in, when it comes to good testing practices is what I mentioned in my previous talk in terms of verifying code coverage. So this is code coverage. I again want to emphasize it's not only just covering the lines of code, but you also want to make sure that the, you're covering when components interact with each other. With each other, you're covering all those scenarios. Another point is that you should have a consistent policy on dealing with failed tests. And those might come from things like how are you tracking the code, what needs to be fixed, who's responsible for fixing it. Another good practice is to have someone from the team watching the test suite and making sure that the decisions about the errors uh, to be fixed are made in a timely fashion. Now, when you are refactoring the code or adding new feature, you should have a regression suite available before you check in the code, uh, because it may happen that uh, you know a part of the code that you've not been working on may be indirectly impacted. So, uh, so it's important to have uh, regression testing. Another point is uh, that's very beneficial is to have code review before releasing uh, the test suite, because somebody looking at a code with fresh eyes may be able to find something that you may have missed. And this is an incredibly you know, cost-effective method and uh, a lot of team use it. So now let's get into, I want to move into some examples of, about development of tests. So the first scenario is test development for a new code. In this uh, scenario, the development of tests and diagnostics usually goes hand in hand with code development. And having good diagnostic tests is important, and it's important to compare against simpler uh, analytical or semi-analytical solution. You know, because what may happen in a testing environment is that, for example, you may have machine precision drifts happening, and you will have to convince yourself that the final answer that you got is uh, different because of the machine drift and not because of some error in your code. Uh, but another thing is that, uh, you know, you should build granularity into testing. I've already said that. Uh, but this granularity that you build can be used for scaffolding your test and building more confidence into testing. What is um, scaffolding? Scaffolding is any code that we write uh, that is not a part of the application, but it is, it is written to provide support for the process of unit testing, integration testing. And as I said, you build scaffolding to build confidence in your testing. Another point is always inject errors to verify that your test is working. And you know it's not always easy to write good tests, but it is uh, extremely important to do it. So after looking at the new code, now let's take a look at how to develop tests for a legacy code. You know, as I mentioned uh, in my previous talk, in many legacy codes, a test may have been developed on software. Uh, those tests might no longer be available. And so what happens is uh, when a user is dealing with just one component of the code, they have to run like the whole model and this could take hours and this could waste people's time. So the idea is that uh, the method that, you, that is used by researchers is to isolate a small area of the code that we want to test. So for example, if we want to test this area where I have my cursor, I, I isolate uh, this area of the code and this isolated area of the code may be coming from somewhere in the middle of the code so in order to start from a point in the middle of the code, what we want to do is we want to dump a state snapshot of that code at this point. And when we run the test, uh, we basically just read uh, the state snapshot and execution can then be done from that point. So we don't have to run the entire model. While running the test, we also need something called as a test driver. And uh, this driver, test driver, will usually work only in this isolated state. So the test driver will focus on working with files that are present in this isolated state. So if there are dependencies that exist uh, uh, between files, we want to make sure that those dependencies are taken care of. And then we might just want to create like a custom file uh, uh, that the driver can invoke. And essentially the point is that you are isolating all the dependencies into this one particular uh, test unit out here. And if you do this, then you have your granular test ready and you can read in the save data and you can run the test and verify you know, whatever you need to verify. And you have to remember that we have to inject errors to verify that the test is actually working. So this example that I gave out here is one way to develop a test for legacy codes and there are many other ways as well. In this third example, we want to build 
scaffolding and structuring and even and structuring for the test in order to pinpoint bugs in different parts of the code. So uh, in this scenario, you can have components that are you know, exercised against simpler application. And, and then you can try to build scaffolding of a verification to gain more confidence in your testing. So like to give you an example, in this picture, you know, you see this gray circle, semi-circles, and these are mocked up dependencies, which means that you can run this test without exercising any other component in the code. Whereas whatever is in blue color, these are real dependencies and the test will not run and therefore it will not give you much information. Now, if all these dependencies are verified, then this will effectively verify the code. So this can be a bit ambiguous. So let's, let me go into a bit more detail to explain this idea of uh, building scaffolding and structuring the test uh, with the purpose of quickly pointing out, pinpointing out uh, to errors. So this, uh, what you see out here is actually a snapshot of like the shock hydrodynamics code that uses something called as AMR, which is adaptive mesh refinement. Uh, so let's focus on just building the test. So the first test we build is called as a guard halo cell fill test. So it's also called as a GC test. In this test, I'll just go into some technical details. Let's assume that there are a lot of processes in this, in this application, in this test, and Let's assume my process, uh, it's also called as a rank in programming model terminology. So my rank has been given uh, an overall domain or data to work with. And the goal is for my rank to update these cells in uh, its domain. The halo cells or guard cells are what you see in blue. They are surrounding my domain. And these halo cells actually get data. They contain data that comes from other processes. So you know the halo cell around rank two will get data that comes from rank three and so on. And so uh, my job is to, and I need the surrounding data to update you know, my individual uh, cells. So the simple test for this would require just two variables. One variable I would initialize just on the cells belonging to my process, my rank, and I won't put values in the halo cells. The second variable I will put, I will initialize both for halo cells and my cells. And then like going to some details, then I would do something called as a guard cell exchange on the first variable. And in this condition, uh, in this condition, if the value in halo cells of the first and the second variable is identical, then the, text is then the test is successful. So this is just laying down the criteria for the test to be, uh, to be successful. And this is one example of a standalone test. Uh, you know, we could also build another test, which is called as an EOS test. It's called as equation of state. And going again into details in this, in this EOS test, you will check for consistency between calculation of energy, calculation of pressure based on you know, temperature density and so on. Both the guard cell and the EOS cell are gray colored and which basically means that they are standalone tests. So after building this standalone test, let's come to the building of scaffolding. You need scaffolding because you cannot execute the shock hydrodynamics code independently. Uh, you know, this hydro test out here that you see in blue color, this has uh, uh, this is this uh, will is this will need both the GC test and the EOS test to uh, to run and uh, uh, so this this hydro test let's go into details again out here this uh, this uh, this hydro test is based on a well known problem in hydrodynamics called state of the test problem so for now just believe that it's doing uh, uh, it has uh, it has the code for uh, testing out hydrodynamics. The hydro, the hydro test, uh, as I said, has dependencies on the GC and the EOS test. But if the scaffolding is right, and if we conclude that the GC test and the EOS test are, are passing, and if the hydro test is failing, then we know that the fault lies in the hydro test code and not in other parts of the code. So although the testing environment exercises the hydro and the GC and the EOS test modules, all of them, but it does it effectively, uh, uh, it, it, do, it does it in such a way that eventually this test will become a way of isolating errors in the hydro test portion uh, of, uh, of the scenario. Now, uh, if we were to uh, you know, exercise the mesh uh, in an adaptive mesh setting, where the resolution changes depending on what other things are going on in the mesh, then the structure of the code and the structure of the restructuring of the test will again become important. 
for AMR, that is adaptive mesh, uh, uh, adaptive mesh, uh, uh, we need to check for specific things like flux conservation, regridling, and we structure our test accordingly. And we reason about the, you know, in the test, we can reason about the correctness of for the flux correction or regridling by running the same test again and again. And this slide out here shows different combinations that you can run in different ways, which will help us understand the, uh, you know, source of errors. This slide out here shows score coverage. And essentially it's a matrix where you have like a different um, set of capabilities. So you have, uh, you know, hydro capability, like you have some capabilities along the column, some capabilities along the, along the, along the rows. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to run the test and then you try to fill in the matrix and your test can follow a specific algorithm. Like you can say that I'll first run all my unit tests, then I'll run tests sensitive to uh, small changes then I can run tests uh, that are important for solvers. Then I can run tests that are the least complex uh, tests. So essentially, it's important. Uh, you know, we don't have to fill the entire matrix, but the point is that we want enough code coverage to ensure that the critical elements of our code are hit upon uh, using whatever tests we have uh, we have designed. So the takeaway basically is that uh, you know we have to understand the cost and the context when it comes to testing. We need to understand the needs. We need to we need to devise tests that enable quick pinpointing of errors. We need to understand testing at the various granularities and whether we want to go with word complexity test. And the overall goal is that we need to have a whole holistic validation strategy. So that was uh, that was the end of my talk. And if there are questions, please put them in the chat window. <laughs>